Hello and welcome back to Black Box. I'm Miles O'Brien. And I'm Lars Perkins. We're discussing the most deadly plane crash involving a single aircraft in history. It was a 747, Japan Airlines Flight 123, that crashed on August 12, 1985, killing 520 passengers and crew. It was supposed to be a short flight between Tokyo and Osaka. But only 12 minutes into it, something exploded and all hell broke loose in the cockpit. This is an unusual crash because the cockpit voice recorder, not just the transcript, the audio itself, is publicly available. And just a warning to our listeners, this is pretty intense stuff. It's now 16 minutes since the aircraft departed Haneda Airport in Tokyo, four minutes since the explosions. The experienced crew of three is trying to regain control. In the cockpit, the captain warns the co-pilot that the engine could stall. Yes, sir, I'll be careful, is the co-pilot's reply. The captain then ordered him to descend, and almost immediately, this call from air traffic control. Can you descend? Flight level 240, that's a pilot term for 24,000 feet. Lars, I still can't, you know, we talked about this earlier. I still don't get it. What, what are your thoughts on this? It is confusing because, as we said earlier, you want to get down to an altitude quickly that's going to have enough oxygen to keep you conscious. Because if you're not conscious, nothing else matters. But they don't do that. There's a term that pilots are familiar with. It's called the time of useful consciousness. As that phrase implies, it means how much time you can remain alert, and for that matter, conscious, at high altitude where the air is thin. My airplane flies at 26 or 27,000 feet, and I'm taught and teach when I train in the airplane that your time of useful consciousness is about five or maybe 10 minutes maximum. So Lars, some years ago, I was doing a story with NASA I was going to fly in one of their aircraft. And so they made me go to Houston and sit in an altitude chamber as part of the training. So they put us all in this chamber. We were all in oxygen masks. And then they pumped out a bunch of air to simulate the atmosphere at 35,000 feet. At 35,000 feet, our time of useful consciousness is about 30 to 60 seconds. When we got to that point, they asked me to take off my oxygen mask and start doing some simple math equations. Once I took that mask off, in less than a minute, I literally could not figure out two plus two, really. Yeah, I haven't done that, Miles, but what I've heard is that not only can you not do two plus two, but you think that's funny. You don't take it seriously, you don't realize that you're really, really impaired. You've got some kind of euphoria, almost like you're drunk. Yeah, it's a little bit like you're high, I completely lost my sense of judgment, and I didn't even care. That's why that's such a dangerous trap to be in. So we know the passengers and the flight attendants were breathing supplemental oxygen because those masks automatically came down, but the pilots were not. So were they hypoxic? And that's the medical term for a lack of oxygen in the air that you're breathing. They probably were. And if they were, would that have figured in the outcome? It's not definitively known that it did, maybe, but it's not likely given the limited ability they had to control the plane. Yeah, they were repeatedly describing the controls as heavy. Obviously, with no hydraulics, that would be an understatement. So if I don't go off, I would do three. Let's go back to that frantic cockpit. It's now 6.33 p.m., a little less than 10 minutes after the explosions. And this is the outer limits of their time of useful consciousness. The flight engineer tells the captain, the R5 masks have stopped. There's only so much oxygen available through those masks. It's the idea is to get the aircraft down to that lower altitude. But now they've run out of oxygen in those masks. (laughs) 
So the flight engineer then tells the captain, we better make an emergency descent. And the captain says, yes. Then the flight engineer says, shall we use mass too, captain? Captain says, yes, we'd better, says the co-pilot. If possible, I think it would be better to use oxygen mass, says the flight engineer again. Yes, says the captain. But there's no evidence they ever did. So if they had put on those masks, the area microphone in the cockpit wouldn't have captured their conversations because your mouth is covered with a mask. It's much harder to pick up the dialogue. But it did memorialize the frantic words right to the end, meaning no masks. So it's likely they were hypoxic and weren't thinking straight. And the next exchange offers further proof. So four minutes later, now we're at 637. They're still about 22,000 feet without hydraulics, and they're struggling to descend. Captain tells the co-pilot, nose down. The co-pilot responds, yes, sir. But evidently nothing happens. The captain yells, nose down. The co-pilot says, yes, sir. Captain tells them to use both hands. And then the flight engineer suggests this. How about putting the gear down? It was a good idea in theory. Deploying the landing gear would create more drag on the aircraft, triggering a descent. Here's the thing that's interesting. This captain, with all that experience we told you about, the Czech airman, says, when they say put down the gear, it doesn't work. The gear won't go down. And that's no surprise, because without hydraulics, they can't operate the gear in the way they usually would. But there is an alternate way to lower the gear without hydraulics. Latches that hold the gear in the stowed position are released. Electric motors facilitate all this, along with the pull of gravity, bring the gear down. This is so crucial. In this circumstance, with no hydraulic systems at all, there was no way to put the gear back up. It could go down, but not up. So you have to ask yourself about the decision to lower the landing gear at that point in time. They're 50 miles west of Tokyo. They had just passed Mount Fuji and were in the mountains. Up until this moment, they were flying that wobbly roller coaster pattern of fugoids and Dutch rolls. But even so, they maintained altitude plus or minus 4,000 feet. Is it possible they could have maneuvered the aircraft towards Haneda Airport, or for that matter, Tokyo Bay, and then used the lowering of the landing gear so that it would initiate a descent for a runway landing, or more likely, a ditching in the bay? The accident reports said it would have been next to impossible. Next to impossible. Interesting, right? But a hypoxic crew on a runaway jumbo jet under such great pressure might never have thought of it anyway. It's now 6.46, 23 minutes after the explosive decompression. And with the gear down, they are descending fast, now heading west toward the mountains. Now, 7,000 feet, where the air is thick enough to sustain cognition, the captain and the crew seem more alert. Uh, He orders full power. They climb to 8,000 feet, where the plane slowed enough to briefly have an aerodynamic stall. The co-pilot asks if he should extend the flaps. Captain says, unable. Co-pilot says, no, sir, with the alternate. The flight engineer concurs. It can be extended with the alternate. A word here about flaps, though. What flaps do essentially is they change the aerodynamics of the wing to make it possible to fly safely at a slower speed. The trade-off, however, you get more lift, but you also get a lot more drag. So if the airplane stalled, basically the wings would stop producing lift. They would descend and crash for sure if they stayed in the stall. Lowering the flaps lowers the stall speed. But increases the drag. Again, the captain, a seasoned Czech airman, in other words, a pilot who is responsible for checking the competence of other pilots, seemed unaware of basic emergency systems and procedures. Hypoxia? Panic? Maybe both. In any case, when the flaps are deployed, things get worse. It causes the plane to bank steeply, beyond 130 degrees. That's practically inverted. 
up in the cockpit. The captain says, power, flap, stop crowding together. Not sure what he meant there. Co-pilot, flap up, flap up, flap up. Captain, flap up. Co-pilot, yes. Captain, power, power, flap. Flight engineer, it's up. Captain, raise the nose, raise the nose. But really at this point, they're powerless to stop. What happens next? It was 656. The 747 hit the mountain, traveling about 300 miles an hour. It was 44 minutes after departure, 32 minutes after the explosions. And it was 22 minutes after sunset. Twilight was fading into night. There was no question, the plane was down. And there was no mystery about where. And yet it took 16 hours for the first responders to get to the crash scene. Kuniko Miyajima heard the news. She and her husband got in their car and they headed straight to the crash site in the tiny village of Wainomura. They were frantically worried about their nine-year-old son, Ken. I thought he was still alive because there were some survivors. I did bring Ken's favorite juice. I did bring his change of clothes. My husband and I went there to bring him back home. But it quickly became apparent Ken was not coming home with them. When we saw the disastrous scene, I could not believe it. I wondered if this was reality. In the sky, there were helicopters flying all over. There was a very heavy smell. I saw the remains, burned, black, and still burning. The soil was so hot. I fell to the ground. The only word I could say was, Gomenne, Gomenne, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 520 people died on that mountain. Amazingly, four passengers survived a mother and daughter, a 12 year old girl and an off-duty flight attendant. All of them were sitting in the back of the plane. The back section of the fuselage broke away on the first impact, and it landed away from the main body of the wreckage, where the wings, the fuel, and thus the fire were. Remember, it happened in a remote, rugged region at nightfall. And this is one of the odd things about this accident, because the U.S. military at Yokota Air Base in western Tokyo offered personnel and aircraft to deploy immediately after the crash. But the Japanese authorities declined their assistance with no explanation. The Japanese launched their own helicopters to try to pinpoint the location, but rescue teams didn't get there until the next morning. At 10.45, almost 16 hours after the crash, they found the first of the survivors. According to the accident report, Japanese self-defense forces spotted the flames from the wreckage at 7.21 p.m. That was confirmed the next morning. The report says that long gap between the crash and the first arrival of rescuers on the site could not be helped. But why didn't they try? Or ask for help from the Americans? Did they assume no one could have survived? Were they worried others would be injured or killed trying to get to the scene? Maybe it was both. Try to imagine what that 16 hours might have been like. One of the survivors was 25-year-old Yumi Ochiai, the off-duty flight attendant. She told reporters that she saw bright lights. She heard the sound of helicopters shortly after she awoke amid the wreckage. And then there's this poignant statement. She said she could hear screaming and moaning from other survivors. 
but this gradually died down during the night. Helicopter news tape just in from the site where a 747 slammed into a mountainside in central Japan. It was just after four in the morning in Seattle when the crash happened. Officials say rescue teams have just found at least four survivors. It was a day this man would never forget. My name is John Purvis. For the record, it's P-U-R-V as in Victor, I-S. When he heard it on the news, he knew he had a flight to catch to Tokyo. I was a Boeing employee for 43 years. In 1981, he was appointed head of air safety investigation for the company. I loved it. It was one of the better jobs I had at Boeing. You don't know what the next phone call will bring. Were you one of those people that has a go bag in the car? Yes, I was one of the people with a go bag in the car. The go bag. Every card-carrying air crash investigator must have one. Clothes, toiletries, all the essentials for a week of grim work in an aviation killing field. Investigators from the government agencies pack those navy blue windbreakers with their affiliation in bold yellow letters on the back. But the Boeing team preferred to keep a lower profile. You're not supposed to prejudge these things, but everybody was, even the NTSB, were speculating. Albeit in an informed way. But they all were thinking... Maybe this is a bomb. This sounded just like another bomb on an airplane. May I have your ticket in the terminal, please? He and his team, five of them in all, got seats on a Northwest Orient flight from SeaTac to Tokyo. A 747 headed to Haneda Airport. When we arrived at the airport, we were surprised that as we stepped off the air stairs... This was the before jetway era. There was hundreds of press on the ground to greet us. They were supposed to get a private ride to the terminal. But the press just clamored on and we all rode together. That was where I realized I really needed some media training. I'm probably a little over three years into the job, so I hadn't received that yet. So he said nothing. I wish I had had an apology ready and had a way to say, we're really here to help your country, your Japanese investigative authorities solve this accident. We're sorry that it was a 747 and we'll do everything we can to find the cause. But I didn't. I just sat there and stared at the camera without saying anything. Deer in the headlights, huh? <laughs> I was. <laughs> it was painfully evident from the start the Americans were not exactly welcome. The International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, part of the United Nations, has rules that guarantee a nation's access to investigations of overseas accidents involving airliners based in their home country. But this was a domestic accident. It was a Japanese flight totally within Japan. The NTSB did meet with the Japanese, but the Japanese were still trying to figure out whether or not we were going to be allowed at the scene. The National Transportation Safety Board was leading the U.S. delegation. And remember, John Purvis was the head of accident investigations for Boeing, the manufacturer of the 747. So why was the company involved in an investigation which might uncover its own culpability for the crash? But this is how the NTSB operates. It names parties, it includes the manufacturers, operators. If it happens in the U.S., the Federal Aviation Administration, all of them participate in the investigation. The simple answer as to why they do this is the NTSB just doesn't have the expertise or the resources to do it all on its own. So it relies on this collaborative process. So I suppose somebody could look at that and say, well, isn't that a conflict of interest? That is exactly right. The um, concern of a lot of people is it's sort of the fox watching the hen house. 
But I suppose if everybody's at the table, I guess whatever conflicts of interest there might be get canceled out. Is that the idea? Having all parties there is one big part of it. We have to share everything with everybody. Besides the bomb theory, there were a few other ideas that got some traction early on. Some suggested the Japanese self-defense forces or maybe the Americans had shot it down, mistakenly or on purpose. Others were focused on the aircraft doors. Perhaps one of them failed, causing the explosive decompression. By now, the lead NTSB investigator, Ron Schleed, had negotiated an access deal with the Japanese. He smoothed things over and talked to the bosses, and it was agreed that as long as we were accompanied by a Japanese investigator, any time we were on scene, we could go up to the crash scene. Roger, flight 807. It was an hour-long helicopter ride to the mountain. What I remember is a very precarious landing site, almost like a platform built out over the edge of the mountain, partly notched into the mountain. And these are real steep volcanic peaks. We're gonna try to find a way around that. They circled the scene two or three times and then landed on a scarily cantilevered makeshift chopper pad. It was a short walk to the debris field. It was clear where the airplane had first hit the ridge, just about where the helicopter pads were, and then had slid down the side of one of these very sharp ridges and into a valley between it and the next ridge over. They were still thinking it was a bomb. It had all the hallmarks, explosions, rapid decompression, and missing pieces. Yes missing pieces. And one of them was crucial. Japan Airlines Flight 123 was missing its vertical stabilizer. Now the vertical stabilizer is that fin that extends vertically from the rear of the aircraft and it houses the rudder which gives you yaw control. It has a great deal to do with the stability of the airplane. 6.47, eight minutes before the flight crashed, there is a photograph that's taken from the ground that shows that it's missing the vertical stabilizer. And everything was gone except for a stub at the leaving the edge. And ultimately the tail was found floating in Sagami Bay, right below where the explosions occurred. But that's not a smoking gun. And you'll excuse me for mixing metaphors. If it was a bomb, it would have left some telltale signs in the wreckage. Fragments of an explosive device will often be left intact. Switches, wiring, timers, circuit boards, or there might be pieces of shrapnel. I seem to recall Pan Am 103, after it was brought down by a bomb, the remnants of the bomb were in fact what led investigators to conclude it was a Libyan plot. That's an amazing tale of detective work. Of course, Lockerbie hadn't happened yet. I spent the first two days looking for evidence in one of the AF laboratories for bomb residue. John Purvis swabbed pieces of the plane, sending samples back to the Boeing labs in Seattle. What was it like being in the midst of that? That must have been rather horrific. You're so busy up there that the horror of it doesn't really sink in. Besides working real hard, it was the middle of August. It's hot. We brought along some food, but not much. So we're hungry, we're hot, we're sweaty. There isn't time really to focus on the bad stuff, I guess. Once the bodies had all been recovered, they shut down the investigation for a few days to allow the families to visit the crash site. Those families left behind a series of shrines to their lost loved ones on the trail between the helicopter pad and the wreckage. That became moving. I think we had some tears and some feeling, uh, what role do we have in this? Probably drives us to find the right answer, too. The bomb theory didn't last very long. John Purvis found no explosive residue anywhere. And it was clear none of the doors had blown open in flight. As far as the shootdown goes, there was no evidence of that either. 
If it had been a shootdown, there would have been evidence of an explosion from the outside in, right? Yes, and this was an internal explosion outward. Just by the way the metal bends, you know how that goes. Pretty quickly, we started concentrating on other parts. But which part? What could have failed and how to cause a mortal wound to a Boeing 747? The answer would come thanks to an eagle-eyed Boeing engineer. The minute he saw the piece, he knew what had happened. And he knew his company faced a reckoning. We'll get into that in our next installment of Black Box. I'm Miles O'Brien. And I'm Lars Perkins. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy this podcast, please do us a favor and subscribe, like, and share it with your friends.